Today on the Matt Walsh Show, children's hospitals around the country are butchering, mutilating, and sterilizing their young patients. New videos reveal just how widespread and depraved this practice is. And that brings us to an important question. What are we going to do about it? I have some ideas. Also, more information is released about the FBI's fishing expedition at Mar-a-Lago. And CBS has figured out why kids these days are fat. It's because of climate change, of course. In our daily cancellation, Kamala Harris tries to explain the concept of equity. It doesn't go well, but in fairness to her, there is no coherent way to explain equity. All of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. Roe v. Wade has been overturned, and this battle is now finally leaving D.C. and going to the grassroots. No group in America is better positioned than 40 Days for Life. With about a million volunteers in a thousand cities, 40 Days for Life holds peaceful vigils outside abortion facilities. They have a larger presence in blue states, with California being their largest state, which is where they're needed the most, so that's very good news. Some former abortion facility directors say these vigils can cause the abortion no-show rate to go as high as 75%, which is detrimental to their uh, abortion business, to say the least. These law-abiding vigils have closed many abortion businesses in America, and nearly half of these closed um, were in liberal cities where abortions will remain legal, including closures in San Francisco, Chicago, and Seattle. 40 Days for Life is effectively changing hearts and minds in the grassroots to end abortion. Check out their locations and podcasts and free magazine at 40daysforlife.com. Now is not the time for us to back down or think that the, uh, the fight is over to protect life in so many ways. It really now just begins, at the very least, it enters a new and very important phase. And that's all we need, 40 Days for Life. So for more information on 40 Days for Life, go to 40daysforlife.com. Welcome back to The Matt Wall Show. I have survived barely my harrowing bout with laryngitis, and it has cleared up just in time because there's a lot to talk about. More importantly, there's a lot to do. We are way past the stage where anything can be fixed by simply talking about it. The rot in this house is too deep, too pervasive, We've ignored it for too long, and now we have only two choices left. We can continue to paint over the problem, put it out of sight and out of mind until the floor gives out and the roof caves in and we're all buried, or we can get to work on some real repairs. Take out the sledgehammers, crowbars, start pulling the rotting pieces out and replacing them with better material. Now, the latter strategy will be difficult. There's no guarantee that we can salvage what's been neglected for so long, but it gives us a chance at least. It's much better than sitting around waiting for the ceiling to fall on us, especially because this dilapidated old shack that we're living in is increasingly unsafe for our children. So late last week, a video went viral from a Boston Children's Hospital advertising what they describe as gender-affirming hysterectomies. In fact, BCH has, or had anyway, dozens of videos on their website and YouTube channel promoting all manner of barbarism and mutilation for minors. For obvious reasons, uh, this one especially caught people's eyes. If you haven't seen it let, yet, let's, uh, let's watch. Gender-affirming hysterectomy is very similar to most hysterectomies that occur. A hysterectomy itself is the removal of the uterus, the cervix, which is the opening of the uterus, and the fallopian tubes, which are attached to the sides of the uterus. Some gender-affirming hysterectomies will also include the removal of the ovaries, but that's technically a separate procedure called a bilateral oophorectomy. And not every gender-affirming hysterectomy includes that, and people who are getting gender-affirming hysterectomies do not have to have their ovaries removed. Mm. Yes, a gender-affirming hysterectomy is similar to other forms of hysterectomies in the same way that having your leg eaten off by a shark is similar to having it amputated because of gangrene. You know, they're similar only in the comparative end result of no longer having that body part attached to you, but the similarities end there because in one, you're getting a necessary and life-saving medical procedure, and in the other, you're being mauled by a savage beast. Whether that beast is a shark or a smiley, polite gender affirmation surgeon, it's the same. You know, naturally, our uh, brave media fact checkers were on the case as soon as that video went viral. A few days later, a series of fact checks were posted, assuring the public that, in fact, these hysterectomies are, are they're not performed on minors at all. They're not. Don't worry. They assure us. It, it's not happening. Doctors wait until a girl is 18, three years before she can legally buy her own wine cooler, seven years before she can rent her own car, before they um, begin removing her reproductive organs. That's a good thing because it's not like 18-year-olds are notorious for making rash and self-destructive decisions that they'll regret later in life, right? I mean, 18-year-olds are perfectly equipped to make any decision imaginable. But of course, the fact checks are also wrong. As a reporter for the Post Millennial, Christina Buttons points out, Boston Children's Hospital follows WPATH guidelines 
And WPATH recommends hysterectomies and genital surgeries for 17-year-olds and double mastectomies for 15-year-olds. Also, she notes BCH will perform a phalloplasty, which is the creation of a fake penis using the severed skin from the forearm at the age of 18. But hysterectomies have to be completed three months before that, which means that they could be done at 17. But this all really amounts to hair splitting. Whether gender-affirming hysterectomies are performed on girls when they're 17 and a half or six months later, the horror and atrocity is that they're being performed at all. And while the trans cult tries to confuse the conversation by quibbling over the exact age in which these various brands of butchery are inflicted on young people, the incontrovertible fact remains that girls as young as 13 are having their breasts chopped off, and both boys and girls as young as 16, if not younger, are undergoing irreversible forms of genital mutilation. And even before any of that, prepubescent children are being castrated and sterilized. And this is happening in every state and in hospital, hundreds of hospitals and other establishments across the entire country. Like the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, for example, which also went viral a few days ago for its own video promoting uh, this particular type of child abuse. Listen. Hi, my name is Priya Dar. I'm one of the doctors at the Center for Adolescent and Young Adult Health here at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I wanted to talk to you guys today a little bit about puberty blockers. Puberty blockers are basically a medication that says, hey, let's just put a pause on puberty. Um, and that can be really beneficial for younger kids who have start, already started the puberty process who either might um, go through a lot of psychological distress as they go through puberty if they're uh, struggling with gender dysphoria, or for somebody who's saying, hey, I'm not really sure if I feel comfortable in my body or, or what gender I truly identify with. They aren't comfortable in their bodies, and so doctors will irreversibly damage their bodies in order to ensure that they will never be comfortable in their bodies. That's the general strategy with puberty blockers. This is also why the claims that surgeries are held until 18 are not only objectively and wildly false, it's just not true, but they're also irrelevant. Because no matter when the surgeries are performed, the stage is set physically and medically before these children even hit puberty. They're put on the conveyor belt heading towards the meat grinder, and most will stay on until they're fed right into it. That's how this is all designed. Indeed, they're put on the assembly line well before the onset of puberty, years before. Another Boston Children's Hospital video promotes the idea that children can identify themselves as trans from the minute they're born. Listen. So most of the patients that we have in the GEMS clinic actually know their gender, usually around the age of puberty, but a good portion of children do know as early as seemingly from the womb, and they will usually express their gender identity as very young children, some as soon as they can talk. They might say phrases such as, I'm a girl, or I'm a boy, or I'm going to be a woman, or I'm going to be a mom. Kids know very, very early. So in the GEMS clinic, we see a variety of young children all the way down to ages two and three, and usually up to the ages of nine. When they come into the clinic, they'll see one of our psychologists and we'll be talking to them about their gender, we'll be talking to their family about how to best support that child and how to make sure that that child has the space and support to explore their gender and uh, do well throughout their development. And we'll be answering any parent questions. A lot of parents do have questions and so we answer those questions. The biggest piece of advice I give parents uh, who are coming through the gender clinic at Boston Children's Hospital is to just be supportive. Um, sometimes you might not understand Sometimes you feel like you don't know the terms or you don't kind of get exactly what the child means when they say that they might be this gender. But the biggest thing you can do is just love your child and support them and just allow them to express themselves. That's the biggest protector as well against negative mental health effects such as depression, suicidality, anxiety that we worry about for our gender diverse kids and young adults. So that support from a parent is one of the best protective factors and one of the best things they can do. From the womb, you know, children, uh, babies just out of the womb don't even recognize, they don't have a concept of their own selves. They have no selfhood. They don't, they don't recognize themselves as being distinct entities apart from their mothers. They, they see them and their mothers as being one and the same. So, uh, but a child with no concept of self can yet have a concept of gender. How do we know this? Well, because uh, they might refuse to get a haircut when they're toddlers, or they're peeing the wrong way, or they're trying on a sibling's clothing 
or they're playing with opposite gender toys, she says. So according to Boston Children's Hospital, literally every toddler who has ever been born or will ever be born is trans. Because that describes the behavior of all toddlers everywhere for all time. Now, if it seems like they're casting the widest imaginable net in order to catch the most children they can and put them all on a path to sterilization and butchery before they can even talk, well, that's because that's exactly what these monsters are doing. They're doing it with full knowledge of what they're doing and why. And they've done it up until this moment without much resistance from the public. But that has to end. We have to stop making it so easy on them. And that's why I'm in the very early stages of trying to organize a national coordinated effort to fight back against this evil. It is to our shame that there aren't rallies and vigils outside of every hospital, every clinic where kids are being butchered and sterilized. It is an indictment on our entire culture and everyone in it that there has not been mass marches on Washington with hundreds of thousands of people speaking out against this. There should be a full-scale assault encompassing activism, lawsuits, political action. We should be pressing every pressure point all at once. Now, so far, there has been resistance, but it's been haphazard, localized, disconnected, usually quite small in scale. Um, I want to change that. I can't do it on my own, obviously. That's the point. Nobody can. But I can use my platform and resources that I have to mobilize an overwhelming national effort to save our kids from this madness, and that's what I'm going to try to do. Now, it's really just a matter of where do we begin. Maybe we begin at Boston Children's Hospital. Maybe we begin with thousands and thousands of people outside of that building. We'll have to figure it out. And I do expect that um, if we really ramp up our efforts to fight back against this, things will get ugly. They already have. For me personally, they have. This weekend, trans activists on Twitter developed a new strategy for coming after me um, personally. They, they decided to start tweeting that I'm a child abuser. Now, there's, of course, no basis at all for this charge. It's not grounded in anything whatsoever. They simply invented it out of whole cloth, knowing that defamatory claims, if they take on a life of their own and are filtered through mostly anonymous accounts that would be difficult to sue for defamation, can be as harmful as they are baseless. Now, they have no moral standards. They have no capacity for shame or guilt. And so there's no lie they won't tell. There's no libel they'll shy away from. This is certainly not the first time that these people have tried to mass, you know, have tried mass defamation against me as a strategy. Since my film came out in June, since before that, really, but especially since the film, I've been constantly slandered and defamed. On top of that, they've tried to get me kicked off of every platform through one mass reporting effort after another. I've been doxxed. They've threatened to kill me many times. Things have happened that I can't even talk about for security reasons, but suffice it to say that the threats have made it close to home. But as far as I'm concerned, these are all prices worth paying. In fact, every bit of slander, every death threat, every dirty trick from these people only radicalizes me even more. If if the backlash has caused me to reflect on anything, it's only made me reflect on why I'm not doing even more to oppose these people. So after that sort of reflection and reconsideration, I've decided to double down, triple down. I've decided to be even more radical and extreme in the fight against this scourge. I've decided to keep doing everything they don't want me to do and saying everything they don't want me to say, except I'll do it more and say it louder. And I'll be a bigger pain in the ass than I've ever been. And I would ask everyone else to make the same pledge. Because we can't sit around waiting for things to improve anymore. I mean, this has to stop. It just has to. And we have to make it stop. Starting now. Let's get to our five headlines. What if there was um, someone out there who kept a log of every single thing you did every minute of the day? I think that would be pretty creepy. But what if I told you that's exactly what happens every time you go online? Your internet provider is allowed to store logs of every website you've ever visited. They can legally sell this data to anyone they want. That's why I always use ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so your internet provider can't see your log, anything you're doing online. Uh, Now, many of you might be wondering, well, if I'm routing all my data through a VPN, then doesn't the VPN 
uh, have access to all that? And, and can they log the data? Well, you're right to think that because many VPNs claim to have a no logs policy, but they've been caught logging customer activity anyway. ExpressVPN is the only VPN I trust because they use trusted server technology. They were the first major VPN provider to engineer all of their VPN servers to run in RAM. This makes it impossible for their VPN servers to store any data, including logs of any Express, ExpressVPN customer. You don't have to take my or ExpressVPN's word for it. ExpressVPN is so confident in their no-logs claim that they have had one of the biggest assurance firms, PwC, audit their technology. And uh, that's how you know. It's no wonder that, that The Verge named ExpressVPN the number one VPN in the entire world. Stop letting people keep logs of what you do online. Visit expressvpn.com slash Walsh right now. Find out how you can get three months free. That's expressvpn.com slash Walsh, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-S, vpn.com slash Walsh. Go to expressvpn.com slash Walsh right now to learn more. You know, when I uh, first came down with the gitis, laryngitis, I um, actually thought it would be not so bad at first, so kind of a nice break. I don't have to talk, you know. But I quickly discovered that not having a voice really makes you an invalid, whether you like it or not, especially in a house with four little kids. You know, my, my loud sort of a booming man voice really comes in handy when it comes when it was hurting the cats at home. But I don't have that. It just, it's just, um, it's really difficult. So if I, all week, if I needed to stop the kids from doing something or tell them to do something, I had to like wave and flap my arms around and use improvised sign language. And even if they knew what I was saying, they would act like they didn't. And I knew what game they were playing. So my son would be like literally climbing the wall and I'd start flailing around. Hey, no, 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 no. And he would just look at me and go, what, daddy? I can't, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, I can't. I would come closer to hear you, but I'm climbing the wall right now and I don't know what you're telling me. So sorry, daddy. These are the ways that you're taking advantage of. Uh, hopefully my, my voice holds up though, at least for, for one show anyway. Um, because I want to start with this. This was a, a story that we were tracking Last week, uh, we talked about last week for the one show where I could talk. Um, Eli Ehrlich is a trans activist and influencer who it was revealed by Libs of TikTok posted on Instagram a few months ago announcing a plan to send prescription hormone pills to anyone who wants them across the country, including minors, in circumvention of state, states that are outlawing uh, dr these drugs for kids. Also in circumvention of like every law, of every federal law. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't just take prescription pills and mail them to somebody um, much less can you organize a distribution network for the illegal uh, distribution and dealing of prescription drugs, which is what Eli Ehrlich confessed to doing. And, um, and it turned out that uh, Ehrlich had uh, talked about this plan many times before. We played the YouTube video with a sort of a, a confession, which has now been deleted. There were other Instagram posts as well. And then there, and then there were these um, other Twitter posts, which Libs of TikTok dug up a couple of days ago, just to show you how often Ehrlich has talked about this. This is on Twitter. This is in violation of Twitter's rules, by the way, of course. Like, you're not allowed on any of these platforms. According to their rules, you cannot use their platforms to facilitate the commission of a crime. And so Ehrlich posted in uh, May. says, as I've said before, if anyone needs hormones who can't get access, message me. I have a network with years of extra doses. This is only a Band-Aid solution to an ongoing political problem, but we can't rely on the state or medical institutions to keep us safe and healthy. Um, update, we now have a full network of trans people with prescriptions for testosterone shots and testo gel too. We refuse to let Texas prevent trans youth from accessing care. That was in February. In Also in February, after reading about the sickening new Texas directive against trans youth, I will personally mail estradiol uh, and uh, spironolactone to anyone worried about the government coming after your kids. F you, Greg Abbott. Okay, so this is, and testosterone, by the way, a Schedule Three controlled substance. But it's being announced on Twitter, on YouTube, on Instagram, this illegal drug distribution thing, plan. Now, I recommended last week reporting this to the DEA. And if you haven't done that yet, then uh, now I know it's the DEA. The, the, the chances that they'll do anything are relatively slim. You should report it anyway. And if you haven't yet, go to the, go to the DEA's website. It's very easy to go Google it, find the tip line, and, um, and send the tip in. Um, Ehrlich also lives, I believe, in New York City. So if you want to contact lo local law enforcement, if you haven't done that yet, I know a lot of people have, you can contact local law enforcement, let them know they have a confessed drug dealer running this prescription drug ring in the city. Maybe they should want to do something about that. I also mentioned that Ehrlich is a PhD candidate at um, University of California, Santa Cruz. Now, I said last week that I'd give the leadership there a day to respond and to tell us what steps they would take to address this 
before I started giving out their contact information. Well, they never did address it, and I was out for a week. So they actually ended up getting a week. And now it's time to escalate. Um, University of California, Santa Cruz is a public university. These officials have no right to ignore this issue. They, they just don't have the right to do it. You can't ignore it. Okay, you're a public institution. There's a confessed drug dealer sending drugs to kids at your school. You can't just ignore the public when we're concerned about it. Um, they have to tell us what they're going to do. So here's what we're going to do. First of all, I want to put up on the screen, we have a, an organizational flow chart for uh, UC Santa Cruz. I want you to take a look at that. Maybe take a screenshot of it or something. These are, and you, you see some email addresses there as well, but there you see uh, all of the, the, the whole leadership at UC Santa Cruz. You see all their names there. And these are all people that we should be reaching out to to ask, what are they going to do about this? A PhD candidate has confessed to a highly illegal prescription drug distribution ring targeting minors. What are you going to do about it, is the question. But we should start, I think, with the chancellor of the university, who is Cynthia Larive, And we'll put her uh, contact information up there. Now, you can email her, chancellor at ucsc.edu. You can call her, 831-459-4291. I would start with her. I mean, she's at the top of the hierarchy. She's the leader, so she should be the first one we contact. There's also Peter Beal, who uh, has his pronouns, of course, listed on his on his um, profile on, on the site. He's the vice provost and the dean of graduate studies. So this is a PhD candidate, also a good person to contact. 831-459-3336 or pbeal, B-I-E-H-L, at ucsc.edu. Um, So I want you to call and email these two officials at the university and ask them what they are doing to to investigate the confessed drug dealer at the university, confessed felon. If they continue to ignore us, next I will find the board of trustees and I will find the donors at the school. And we're going to start reaching out to them. And after that, if we still don't get a response, then we're going to show up there with a crowd of people. I'll, I'll come there personally because you cannot ignore us. That is not an option. If this was anybody else, if this was not a trans person, if this wasn't hormone prescription pills, but some other prescription being distributed as part of this illegal drug dealing ring, um, we all know the university would have kicked this person out of the school by now. Instead, they want to give them, you know, instead it's, it's, uh, it's well, we're going we're gonna to give all, not even benefit of the doubt, it's just all the, it's, it's a, it is a get-out-of-jail-free card, literally. But that's not going to be acceptable. So, again, what are you going to do about it, university? You have to tell us. I will not allow you to ignore us. You cannot. It is not an option. All right. Let's move to this. Daily Beast says, Former President Donald Trump is under investigation for several violations of the Espionage Act, and illegally keeping uh, top-secret government documents when he left the White House last year, according to court documents unsealed Friday afternoon. And the FBI was spurred to move so aggressively and search the former president Mar-a-Lago Oceanside Estate in Florida because some of the documents they were seeking pertain to the nation's nuclear weapons. Uh, this is, of course, by the way, this is not this is this is the first time, right, that uh, that the intelligence community has told us stories about things related to nuclear weapons in order to justify some outrageous activity that they're engaging in. This has never happened before, right? I mean, I might be able to think of one or two other times, maybe. I, I, it's, it's hard to remember. That was so long ago. The FBI search warrant lists three federal statutes to justify the search of the Palm Beach, Man- Paul, Palm Beach Mansion. Uh, that means the Justice Department, in historic move, is investigating the former president for violating the Espionage Act mishandling federal records, and falsifying official documents to obstruct an investigation. Now, the Espionage Act, totally absurd to use on on President Trump. Um, And Trump has repeatedly stated that he declassified all of these documents before bringing them to his house, which is something that he is able to do. I mean, that's that's what you're able to do as, as a president. You can just, like, wave your hand, essentially, over a box of documents and say, this is declassified. It is pretty much that easy. You can declassify anything you want as a president. 
So this was obviously a trolling attempt, and not trolling in the sense of my favorite pastime, but trolling as in the fishing technique, which is, I guess, my second favorite pastime. This is just throwing some lines in the water, drifting across the lake, and uh, hoping you get a bite. That's all this is. Now, you know, there's a lot of people making predictions about where this goes from here. A lot of, uh, you know, hear a lot of conservatives saying, well, Trump's going to get frog marched. He's, they're going to put him in cuffs. They're going to, you know, and, and maybe they will do all of that. But they also have to know, obviously, that through this act, action, they have boosted Trump's 2024 chances considerably, and especially in the primaries. Now, how much they're going to help him in the general, I'm not sure. But the fact that they've helped him in the primaries, to put him, you know, he was already at the top of the heap among Republican uh, challengers. But to make that divide even wider, I mean, they've, they've done quite a bit there. If they were to put President Trump in handcuffs and have that image out there, well, then that would just, that would... Uh, all the more solidify, if he wasn't already solidified, as the almost certain nominee in 2024. Which does make you wonder about conspiracy theories. And I've heard others asking this question, like, did they do this to intentionally boost Trump and drown out DeSantis? We've been, we've been hearing the drumbeat for a long time, and there was even, there was someone today who posted it again, some, uh, Lib blue check, I don't remember who, who said, you know, DeSantis, is a, he's, he's even more dangerous than Trump. He's even more dangerous. And that's what they really believe. They believe that DeSantis is a greater danger to their agenda than Donald Trump is. I think they're probably right. I think, I think they're right in that assumption. So all I'm saying is that if they wanted to make sure that Trump is not the nominee and not DeSantis, what they did last week would be the be- there'd be no better plan than that. That's like the best possible thing they could have done to ensure that Trump is the nominee and not DeSantis. So that's the conspiracy theory. Did they do this intentionally to boost Trump and drown out DeSantis? And also put DeSantis in a position where he feels like he has to support Trump for president rather than running himself. You know, it's not a crazy theory. The only reason that I don't, uh, I, I understand why people have theorized about it. The re- only reason I don't subscribe to it is that, and maybe I, maybe I underestimate them to my own de- detriment, but I don't think the regime is smart enough to play chess on that level. From everything I've seen, they're not quite smart enough for that. Because that would actually be a brilliant chess move. I'm not sure if they're that smart. I think it's, uh, it's more likely that they are just, they can't help themselves. I mean, this has been the story with the left and the left's approach to Trump ever since he showed up on the scene. They cannot help themselves. Every, all of the freakouts, all the panicking, um, the, the way they constantly talk about him, keep him in the headlines, it only helps him. And, but they can't help it because they hate him so much. And they're so emotional that they can't control themselves. Now, we also have to keep in mind, too, that we're talking about um, bureaucracies. You know, we're talking about the government. And uh, so there are going to be a lot of different motivations playing into this. So maybe at some level, somewhere, there are some people pulling the strings uh, with, with some more intention behind it. I don't know. All right, CBS News has noticed that kids today are fat. And uh, I think we've all probably noted that. And they found the culprit. It's not what you think. Or maybe it is, if you think just like these people. God pity you. Uh, Let's listen. There's a new study showing how climate change, specifically higher temperatures, is making our children uh, more inactive and more obese. The study published in a journal Temperature found today's children are 30 percent less aerobically fit than their parents were at their age. Fewer children are reaching the World Health Organization's recommendation of 60 minutes of exercise a day. Now, listen, it has been a lot hotter hotter and the weather has been crazy but i think it also has to do with technology you know yeah it's it's one thing not to go outside but 
These kids don't go outside because they can stay inside, <laughs> be on their phones, play video games, and be social without having to go outside and be social. Okay, well, it's not a lot hotter, first of all. According to the government's own climate change website, climate.gov, you can go there. Um, temperatures have risen two degrees Fahrenheit since pre-industrial times. So that's if, if we're going with their data, and we're just going to accept it on face value, then two degrees in 150 years. According to this information, we're about a half a degree hotter, maybe, than we were when I was a kid in the 90s. And this counts as a lot hotter. It explains why kids don't go outside. Turn the temperature down by half a degree, and it changes, or turn it up, rather, by half a degree, and it changes everything? Really? But, but what about the seasons? So every time these people talk about climate change, they just ignore the concept of seasons. I mean, the temperature does drop by a lot more than half a degree for kids today um, because it's not summer temperatures all year long unless you live on the equator. So do kids suddenly go outside and play in the fall, in the spring, uh, in, the, in the winter, in the early summer? No, they don't. Also, by the way, you can look at obesity rates by state and there is no correlation between average temperature and obesity. West Virginia is one of the fattest states, with a, but it's got a mean annual temperature of 56 degrees. West Virginia but it's, it's a beautiful, the, the temperature is, at least by my, for, for my taste, the temperature is always, almost always great. It's a beautiful place, a beautiful state to, to uh, go and run around outside. And yet, it's, it's the second fattest state in the country. Florida is, on average, 20 degrees or more hotter, and yet it's one of the skinniest states. And this becomes um, even more, you know, this lack of correlation becomes even more apparent when you look at it on a global scale. Okay, because there are a great many very hot, um, tropical, you know, climates where people are not only not obese, but oftentimes famished, starving. You know, their ribs are poking out of their bodies. And why is that? Well, because this is about food. Okay, obesity is about food. It's about the food you put in your body. It's how many, how much, how many calories you put in your body versus how many you burn. That's where obesity comes from. That's it. That is the whole story of obesity. If you are obese, it is because you are taking in a lot more calories than you're burning. End of discussion. And that's why in third world countries, um, they don't seem to have the fat gene, surprisingly. Why is that? Because they're not eating enough. And if you don't eat enough, then instead of being overweight, you're going to be very much underweight. So why are kids fat? Um, it, I mean, it is an important question. It is something we should be talking about. But they're fat because they're eating garbage food and they're sitting around on their phones all day. We hear the CBS guy at the end, he, he makes mention of that. Well, I think it has something to do with technology too. No, it's not just something to do with technology. That's the whole, that, that along with, with the food, that's, that's, that's the whole story. 50% to 50% right there. The food is bad. And kids are sitting around on their phones all day. Doesn't matter how beautiful the temperature is outside. And it's even worse. Like it's, you know, this is, this is beyond, we, we've gone way beyond mere laziness or anything like that. Kids, many kids today no longer have just the innate desire to go run around outside. Okay. And that, and that should be innate. Now, I know for my own kids, we don't give them phones. We don't do technology. Um, we, don't, we, they, we have a TV. We don't let them watch it that much, though. And, and, and my kids can certainly be lazy. Don't get me wrong about that. But they still have this youthful, natural energy where they just, they want to be outside. I mean, I, I hear all that, well, it's, it's too hot for kids to go outside. We live in Tennessee. It's like 6,000 degrees here all the time with a humidity of 6,000%. And my kids will go run around outside. We have to tell them to come in so they don't get heat exhaustion. And that's normal for kids. That doesn't make my kids special. Quite the opposite. It just makes them normal kids. 
But for a lot of kids, they, they, they've become so numb, so sort of dead to the world that they don't even have the desire to run outside and explore and go into the woods and just whatever kids do. You know, we, we all tell the stories about when we were kids and you'd go out and, you know, you'd go out at seven o'clock in the morning, you'd come back, you wouldn't be back until dinner. Well, that's not just a get off my lawn, you know, back in my day kind of rant. It is an observation about a wide sweeping social change that has happened in this culture. And it is a, it is a, a horrible change. I mean, we, we still really cannot conceive of what this is going to be like in the future. To have a generation of kids raised on this stuff, raised on screens, utterly dependent on them from toddler on. Um, what does that look like? What kind of world are we living in in 40 years, 50 years? I mean, certainly it's going to be a fat world, even fatter than it is now. But in a lot of ways, that's like the least of our problems. All right, so this is kind of um, old news, but I've had it earmarked for over a week, and uh, I have to say something about it. It's the kind of thing I just have to comment on. So, all right, we know that um, ESPN sports commentators have an average IQ somewhere slightly below like a hermit crab, though perhaps slightly above an oyster. I'll give them that. I'm not totally convinced on the latter point. I mean, they are very dumb is the point. They're also left-wing hacks. Um, yet the most important thing that I'm always reminding people about the sports commentators is that they are, with rare exception, embarrassed to be sports commentators. Now, there's, there's nothing at all ignoble or shameful about the profession in and of itself. We have sports commentators here at the Daily Wire. Crane and Company, very talented, intelligent, put together a really good show. There's nothing wrong with, with, with talking about sports and, and, and that's your job. But the ESPN brand of sports analysts, they take a different approach. They apparently find their vocation to be lacking in importance. And so their egos and delusions of grandeur lead them to conclude that they can't simply talk about sports and leave it at that. They have, to, they have to have important things to say, right? They have to start conversations. They have to be thought leaders. And it's, it's just a problem to be a thought leader when you don't have any thoughts. And so they attempt to be culturally and politically relevant in ways that strain their poor, tiny brains and lead to extremely embarrassing episodes like this from former NBA player uh, turned NBA commentator Jalen Rose. He took to social media a little while ago, it was a week or two ago, to offer his thoughts on the history of Mount Rushmore. Now, if you at any point in your life have wondered about Jalen Rose's opinions vis-a-vis -vis Mount Rushmore, well, um, here you go. Why do you think Washington changed their name from Redskins? I do a show and didn't say that word for eight years. And my co-host, David Jacoby, we both said they're going to change the name one day. Why? Because it's offensive. What about the Cleveland Indians? Same thing. Why did they change the name? Because it's offensive. So I want to continue to challenge myself and to challenge you to do something. Can we retire using Mount Rushmore? That should be offensive to all of us, especially Native Americans, the indigenous people, who were the first people here before Christopher Columbus. That land was stolen for them when it was discovered that it contained gold. And 25 years later, to add insult to injury, four American presidents were put on what we call Mount Rushmore on the top of the dead bodies that is buried right underneath. So I call for you and for myself, I'm owning this too. Let's stop using the term Mount Rushmore when we're talking about our favorite rappers, talking about our favorite movies, we're talking about our favorite players. I know you're going to see this video and I know you're going to take action. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not going to take any action at all. This guy's at, at the beach, beautiful day, and, he, and he's sitting there thinking about why he's offended by Mount Rushmore. What kind of what kind of mind works that way? And of course, needless to say, this might make it onto the Mount Rushmore of stupid opinions. But let's back it up. He begins by asking, 
why the Redskins changed their name. He says it's because the name is offensive. Now, there was a time when a jock, right, a former athlete, would rather drown himself in the nearest river than publicly admit to getting their feelings hurt by a sports mascot. Just talk about changes through, through time. To be a, an athlete, talk about, well, it's an offensive mascot. A f- you know, there, was, there, was, there was a time when no, no, no man at all, but certainly no athlete, would, would, would speak that way. He then claims that the Cleveland Indians is also an offensive name, yet he, like every other member of the PC Brigade, can't begin to explain why. If the term Indian is so insulting, then why do the Indians themselves use it? In fact, I went to the National Congress of American Indians website, the National Congress of American Indians, Indians website, that's a, and found literally dozens of tribal organizations that all have the word Indian in their names. Dozens of actual groups of Indians calling themselves Indians. Why is it offensive? Then, he, of course, he moves on to the topic at hand, talking about Mount Rushmore, why it's offensive. Um, he says it's, uh, you know, hurtful and traumatizing to the indigenous people who Rose says were, were there first and, you know, had their land stolen and then, um, and then faced the added indignity of having four presidents carved into the mountain right over top the dead bodies. Now, as to that last claim, I can tell you that Mount Rushmore is carved into granite. So I highly doubt that there were grave sites desecrated. I don't think they were burying people in granite. That would seem like a rather, uh, it's, a, it's an impractical way of disposing of bodies, to, to bury them inside a granite rock face. But did we steal the land, as Rose claims? No, the Black Hills, where the monument is located, have changed hands many times over the centuries. The Lakota most recently had it, before the Americans had it. Before them, it was the Cheyenne. Before them, it was another tribe. On down through the years. Different groups of people fighting and killing over that piece of land. The, quote, indigenous people were not a monolith. They were not homogenous. They were not a united people or culture or nation. It doesn't even make any sense to talk about them in that way. That's not how they saw themselves. It's not, that's not the real. They all just happened to live on this continent. And they were fighting and killing each other over the land for thousands of years. They were warring factions who slaughtered each other mercilessly. The Americans couldn't steal the Black Hills from the Lakota for the same reason that, you know, you couldn't be accused of stealing a car from a thief who just stole it from somebody else. Right? I mean, to, to imagine you had a car that is just, just perpetually stolen so often that we don't even know who had it first now. Well, there might be someone who's the victim. We don't even know who that person is. But if you run up and take it from the person who most recently stole it, they can't claim that they, what are they going to go to the police and say, well, he stole the thing I stole. That's essentially what's happening. But there's another point too. This, this is why this sort of thing really annoys me. Is that we have this guy, Jalen Rose, plays a game for a living, flippantly sort of dismissing the careers and contributions of Theodore Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, and Thomas Jefferson. He's offended by their presence on the monument. Each of those men, in any random six-month period of their adult lives, accomplished more and had a greater and more positive impact on the world than Jalen Rose has ever had or ever will have. Jalen Rose could live 50 lifetimes and not achieve what one of those men did in six months. That's how significant they were. They deserve to be on the mountain. When you have a life like that, and you contribute to that extent to civilization, then yeah, you deserve to the monument. You deserve to be on the mountain. And they deserve it more than any Indian tribal chief, as they all contributed far more to the society we currently live in. And they helped to build our civilization in a way that no tribal leader ever did. Which isn't much of a knock on tribal leaders. I mean, it's a high bar to clear, admittedly. They, they all have a, had, had a greater impact on the world than I have ever had or ever will have also. Okay, so I'm admitting that this is a bar that's really hard for anyone to get over. So it's not really an insult when I say, well, you don't stack up to these guys. Almost nobody does. But that's, be, but that's why none of us end up on the sides of mountains. That is reserved for the greatest 
And when we say great, we don't mean perfect. We don't mean saints. We mean great in terms of the contribution. Like there's a reason we still talk about them. To, to, to live and die. And 100 years later, 150 years later, 200 years later, people are still talking about you and learning about you. That means that you lived in a way that was just that, that far surpasses most people. Most of us will live and die, and nobody will ever talk about us. Once our, once our immediate family has go, gone along with us and they go to the grave, no one will ever say our names ever again. It's a, it's a really startling and depressing thing to think about, but it's true. For the vast majority, of it, we will die, and then our families will die, and our names will never be uttered again on earth. So that's most people. That's like 99.999% of all people. And you stack it up against the people that have the monuments and they get the cities and everything named after them. Um, That's because of the greatness of those people. And we should admire greatness rather than being offended by it. All right, let's get to the comment section. Daily cancellations are the law. Regardless of what the administration defines as a recession, Americans are certainly worried. Food and gas prices are higher than I've ever seen them in my lifetime, which is why I'm so grateful for my favorite meat delivery service, Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers offers a recession-proof subscription model that lets you lock in your price the day you subscribe. Imagine if car companies did this. Like, what if you uh, could have bought your 2020 Ford at 1990s pricing? That's what Good Ranchers does for its customers. Not only that, but Good Ranchers is also currently running a back-to-school give-back program with the goal of donating 100,000 high-quality meals this month to children in need. So go to goodranchers.com slash Walsh. Use code Walsh at checkout. They'll get $30 off plus free shipping. You can um, subscribe to lock in your price and recession-proof your meals for life. And you can help these guys reach their goal of donating 100,000 meals to children who may need it going into the fall semester. That's goodranchers.com slash Walsh and use code Walsh at checkout. Well, we only had one show last week, as you know. Um, Our most recent video was something we posted on Thursday when I was still besieged by laryngitis. Um, Heroically, I came to work. I recorded a short video message about my battle with the illness um, using subtitles and a robot Stephen Hawking voice. And by the way, that video did like way better than any actual full show that we do, which is a little bit depressing, but at least it made it worth the effort. Because you have no idea um, the physical pain, but also shame I had to endure to bring you that video. I mean, I had to come here to this place, unable to speak, and I was literally discriminated against and mocked for my disability. This is true. My own producer, Sean, kept saying things to me that he knew would annoy me, but I, I couldn't respond to. He was slandering beekeepers in my presence. Couldn't say anything. Couldn't hit him because that would be an HR violation, not to mention a hate crime. And then, I mean, it just, even our makeup artist, Cherokee, was, she joined in. She said, uh, what's the matter? Cat got your tongue? I'm like, what, what is this? I, I'm actually disabled. What if I was blind? What, what if I, I swear, if I came in here blind, there'd be people like sticking their legs out and tripping me, laughing, stealing my walking cane. Hey, blindy, who turned the lights out? Hey, blind man. That's the ableism we're talking about. I could probably sue at this point, and the whole I would own the whole company. But owning it is too much responsibility, so I'd rather just complain. That's really more my speed. Anyway, let's read some of the comments from the Sweet Baby Gang on that video, because they were much more supportive of my plight than anyone in this building was. I can tell you that. So, uh, Salvis says, I don't even have words for how inspiring this was. Speechless. Emily says, I too have survived laryngitis twice in one year, actually, while deployed, truly harrowing. I was mocked and ridiculed, called Minnie Mouse, likened to the mice of Cinderella, a lot of mice references. Until now, I've not had the courage to tell my tale. Thank you, Matt Walsh, for inspiring me to speak my truth. Sarah says, as a recent laryngitis survivor myself, this video made me feel seen. I've always been so oppressed for it, as people didn't change the way they lived their lives to cater to the fact that I had no voice. I mean, how hard is it to start writing everything down on pen and paper so I'm not so marginalized? Magic Robot says, our hearts are with you, Mr. Walsh. You are so brave. Thank God there's finally someone to speak for the silent struggle. Dan says, your emotional labor is seen and heard, Matt. Never stop fighting the vocal oppression. 
Sour Sweet Tooth says, uh, Matt seems to forget that he has a form of communication even more powerful than his voice at his disposal, dance. He's proven his ability to communicate complex ideas and opinions through interpretive dance, so there's little reason for episodes to be canceled this week. His opening monologue, the five headlines, responses to comments, and even the daily cancellation could all be done effectively, dare I say masterfully, through dance routines, and the sweet babies would witness and understand. Okay, we were on a good roll with all the supportive comments, and because this is all you're supposed to do. When someone is going through something and, and they're disabled, um, all you're supposed to do is tell them that they're a hero and that what they're going through is the worst thing anyone has ever experienced. What you don't do is you don't give advice or tell me that I should dance for you like some sort of wind-up monkey dancing for your amusement. Is that what you think of the, the voice-depleted community? Uh, why Mills says, Matt, what's the status on the walrus? Did you uh, come back to your studio after your week of desperate illness to find it waiting for you? That would have been nice, wouldn't it? That'd be a nice thing for someone to th I've thought about. After what I went through for that entire week and all of the abuse, it could have all gone away if I had just walked in here and seen my walrus just sitting there waiting for me. It's still not here. And I haven't rest. I'm not going to rest about that. I will, I will track that walrus down. I will, I will find the walrus. Are you still giving your money to woke razor companies that hate your values, see masculinity as toxic, and think you should teach your daughter to shave her beard? There's a better way. Jeremy's razors are 100% real and 100% woke free. The premium matte tungsten handle has more heft than the left. The razor head pivots without caving and has six blades that are sharper than truth. I'm just delivering this really well, I think. Those uh, other razor companies keep virtue signaling to the totalitarian left and using your money to do it, but you don't have to let them. When you buy Jeremy's razors, you aren't just making Jeremy richer, you're making the woke left poorer, which is more important. 75,000 people have already made the switch. Visit IHateHarrys.com to get your Founder Series Shave Kit today. That's IHateHarrys.com. Jeremy's razors, shut up and shave. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. <laughs> Vice President Kamala Harris is known for sputtering and babbling indecipherably like a very large infant, but amid her stammerings, she'll sometimes say things which warrant further consideration, not because they're intelligent, but because they're especially stupid and harmful and usually malevolent. She manages to sneak in these sorts of toxic morsels unnoticed at times because her critics are too stunned by the general inanity of her comments to bother parsing through the finer details. And I think this happened uh, this weekend when another classic Kamalaism went viral here she is speaking at something called the Oakland Generation Fund event. Listen to what she says. So when we talk about equality, well, that's a good goal. But let us not presume that because everyone should be treated equal, that they start out on equal footing. So equity, as a concept, says, recognize that everyone has the same capacity but in order for them to have equal opportunity to reach that capacity, what we must pay attention to this issue of equity if we are to expect and allow people to compete on equal footing. So equity says that we must pay attention to the issue of equity, a perfectly circular and meaningless statement. But buried within this mangled jumble of words is a relatively accurate, therefore horrifying, description of, as she says, the concept of equity. And the concept of equity really matters because though it's malignant and insane, we happen to live in a society now formally structured around it. So Harris says that according to the doctrine of equity, we all have the same capacity, but we don't end up in the same place or achieve the same things because we don't start in the same place. She says that equality is a nice goal, but you can't get there until first you create equity. Now, when she says capacity, it's clear from context that she means potential. She's talking about reaching our full capacity, reaching our full potential. So we all have the same inherent potential, she says. And if we don't all arrive at the same finish line at the same time, it's because of a lack of equity. That is a lack of equality at the starting point. So she envisions a world where as long as the starting line is the same for everyone, everybody will run through the tape at the exact same moment and hoist the first place trophy all together in unison. Because that's how races work, obviously, right? I mean, if everyone starts at the same place, then like there's no reason why anyone would get to the finish line first. Well, this, of course, is nonsense. We do not all have the same potential or the same capacity. Uh, it doesn't matter 
where I started in life, I was never going to play basketball like LeBron James or the guitar like Jimi Hendrix, nor could, I, nor could I have enjoyed a career similar to, much less the same as Isaac Newton or uh, Leonardo da Vinci, no matter how level the playing field was. On the other end of it, you could take literally every environmental advantage away from me. You could take all of my money and resources, reduce my life to rubble, and there's virtually zero chance that I would end up living under a box on the street shooting heroin from dirty needles. My inherent potential for that fate is about as low as my potential to become an NBA Hall of Famer. So when we talk about potential or capacity, whichever word you choose, we're talking about what you're capable of achieving, what you can build with your basic raw material, your personality, your strengths, your weaknesses, your, your intellect, your drive, your physical stature, your virtue, your vices, everything. Now, environment may play a role in forming some of this, but there's no way to level that playing field without simply lobotomizing everybody and making us all vegetables like Joe Biden. If Kamala doesn't have that in mind, though maybe she does, I don't know, then she must believe that even in spite of the differences in a person's intellect, personality, ambition, etc., still we should end up in the same place, as if the raw material means nothing. And that, again, is abject nonsense. But our country revolves around it because that's what equity says. Now, it's not hard to see why the powers that be find the equity myth so useful. First of all, it gives them a pretense for chopping down all the stalks that, are, that have grown too tall. They can sort of keep everybody in check by kneecapping anyone who enjoys too much prosperity. And as they go all Tanya Harding on the successful ones, they can justify it by claiming that these people only got to this point because of unfair systemic advantages. Not because they worked harder. Certainly not because they're smarter or better than anybody else. That, of course, is one of the most important equity tenets, by the way. Um, differences in intelligence don't exist, or they don't matter. Everybody is equally smart and equally stupid. Then, by obsessing over equity, people become, by design, resentful and suspicious towards each other. Rather than looking with admiration on those who have achieved greater things, trying to learn from them, like we should do with the men on Mount Rushmore, seeking them out as mentors and coaches, which I guess you can't really do with those men in particular because they're dead, but in general, rather than doing that, instead the equity-minded person hates the more successful person. He feels an unjustifiable and irrational sense of somehow having been robbed by that person. He sees what other people have and believes that he should have all the same things, and he would have them if not for the mysterious, invisible, yet somehow systemic roadblocks that have been put in his way. Now, all of this misfortune, all of his misfortunes and failures are, are due to the system, he says. Therefore, he must go to the system, ironically, to the government for the solution to his problems. Equity not only makes people resentful and suspicious, but also, most importantly, dependent. The system created the inequities that you allegedly suffer from, so then only the system can fix them. And here's the good news. People like Kamala Harris, who've been in the system and helping to run it for decades, Hold the key to solving all the problems and healing all of your trauma. Just please don't stop for even a second and ask why they never used the key if they've had it this whole time. Don't think critically about it. Don't evaluate anything. Don't use your brain. The whole point of equity is that you shouldn't have to. Just sit there slack-jawed and helpless, mouth agape like a baby bird, waiting for mommy bird to come by and regurgitate your daily rations. That is exactly how people like Harris want all of us to be. They want you to be angry, sad, bitter, resentful, envious, and also totally, desperately dependent. And that is why Kamala Harris is canceled for the fifth time, but not just can Kamala Harris, the entire concept of equity is also today canceled. And that is not it for us today. Some exciting news, actually. We're adding a new segment onto the show for subscribers. After the cancellation every day, we're going to go to the mailbag and answer longer questions, give maybe give some advice, maybe um, answer some criticisms, hopefully read some hate mail on occasion to keep it fresh. It'll be a fun segment, but you have to be a member to watch it. So click the link in the description, and uh, we'll see you over there.